great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, we have Ingo Ruf from uh, Free University in Berlin. Ingo is a PhD student in a group of Ian's Eisert. He's, I think, close to finish his PhD. And uh, what can I say about uh, Ingo? He's a specialist in like mathematical aspects of quantum information, especially uh, things like certification, tomography, randomized benchmarking. Uh, conference sensing. I'm like improvising here a bit, but I think it's that's more. Uh, and, uh, I'm flattered. Yeah, I'm, I'm yes. totally flattered by these words. Right. Um, right. And today he's going to uh, tell us about semi device dependent approach to tomography. So uh, there, are di that there are different people mean different things by using uh, semi device independent, the space semi device independent. So uh, I'm very curious what Ingo has yes. to say. Please, uh, the screen is yours. So the, the, the title is already like kind of bad style because we're introducing a lot of buzzwords. So first of all, thanks a lot for the kind word. This was really flattering. You know. And thanks for having me um, and, and letting me share this work, which we, we put on the archive during the summer. And it's, we've been working on this for quite some time. So Jad Viga started at this with his, his now master's student started with a bachelor thesis working on the project and um, yeah, Dominic and Jens, this was our, our joint venture. So coming back to the buzzwords of the title, um, there, there's a well-defined notion, I think, of what semi device or what device independent means. And um, I use a different word. I use the word semi device dependent, which is, so there's an in, uh, missing here for good reasons, and, and I'll explain in the motivation of the talk why we want to, to call also some methods semi-device dependent as opposed to semi-device independent. And the other thing is, it's about to tomography. I'll talk about the scheme um, which comes, uh, which will do quantum state tomography, but in a blind way, and it, the blind is regarding the exact calibration of the device. So this will be the topic of the talk. And let me start with a motivation, which I think I don't tell you much new. There's a lot of hype about that we're actually able to build. This is even like the, the older Google ship, these, these incredible devices, industry is joining in and really scaling up, the, up the, the endeavor there. And we have quantum computing devices that operate already at a fairly interesting level at least to do basic research for them. But in order to fulfill all our dreams, we need um, high control over these devices. So, I mean, they are by far not as precise as we would like them to be. And this basically makes uh, is necessary to, to have an entire zoo of ways to characterize these devices. And with characterization, there are different ways of characterizing. You can just be interested in certifying a device that it's accurately performing something. You can learn, ask for tomographic information for example, that gives you some hint of what's going wrong and then you are able to, to correct potentially by uh, experimental control. So there's a lot of different methods and a lot of needs for these uh, devices. But at the same time, since all devices which we use, including state preparation, measurement, and the gates actually are kind of noisy, we actually want, um, okay, so now the, the disclaimer, um, so most, a lot of schemes which were envisioned in the past, for example, for state tomography can be, can be actually called as fully device dependent. So they are kind of like on this edge of the spectrum. At the same time, there are other very clever methods which are called device independent, which can then, for example, self-test a certain state or at least certify entanglement of a state. But at the same time, the amount of information which you can extract by schemes on this side is, is fairly limited compared to like the full tomographic information, which you can do in a fully device dependent, fully relying on a calibrated measurement device, for example. And there's actually a lot of a huge stretch in between. And people have, have, have come from this side, so from the semi, and introduced semi device independent methods, where they, for example, ask for certain restrictions on the dimension of the Hilbert spaces involved in something like this. So a couple of assumptions. But at the same time, I argue that in, in the modern technologies, the, the, the interesting corner is kind of like this area, which I want to, to, to call semi-device dependent, where you just slightly um, weaken the assumption of fully device dependence towards um, yeah, more, more practical methods. 
So it's semi device dependent as like the, the other error coming into the spectrum of making assumptions more realistic, but starting from the fully device dependent area. So we want to look at characterization methods for quantum devices, which work under some realistic assumption and are partly or approximately characterized to some extent. Wait, I'm, I'm still like, because uh, I must confess, maybe you didn't see it on chat. Because uh, like when I saw okay, your- Sorry, I, I can open the chat. No, 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 don't worry. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't, it was not to, to you. Uh, it was more like, a, it, it was not directed to you. So don't, okay. so I was like, when I was reading the title because of, uh, like people like before people often use this phrase semi, semi device independent and yes. of course i have fallen even when i was introducing your title i have fallen for this because uh, like like there exists like already like prior to your work there exists like something in between device independent and fully device dependent and people used semi device independent Right? Yeah, but, but typically right? so the- Wait, just the question, my question is what is really like, uh, uh, what is gonna to be like, what is the difference like between semi-device dependent and semi-device independent? So, so, so obviously semi just means like half the way. So, I mean, uh, so, so in every, I mean, it, it's a spectrum and things meet in the middle. Yeah. But I think if the, the word, how people are using it, like semi, device independence typically really refers to starting from device independence and then using a couple of right. assumptions in order to get things going. Yeah. But I mean, at the same time, there are a lot of methods and also methods that exist, which could be classified as semi-device dependent, which start from, from like a fully characterized measurement device. Yeah? So the measurement device is fully characterized and then they start relaxing slowly the assumptions. And mm -hmm. this will, also, this work will be one of these examples. So we, I mean, okay. it's, it's, I think it's misleading to tell, call the semi-device independent in a sense, because I mean, we still need like some calibration model and a lot of assumptions. But I, I would argue that still the, the more realistic, for example, randomized benchmarking would also be in the corner of like semi-device dependent work. You need still a lot of assumptions to get randomized benchmarking. There's a gate model and everything thing working. But yeah, so therefore I think yeah. like these, there's a, there's a need for another word for this yeah. corner. Uh, yeah. I buy this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So this is kind of like where this, and please allow me also to advertise a couple of other drafts, which we, we, which are more overview drafts on, on like the entire field of characterization, which, which I've put out with collaborators during the last year. Um, for example, like on, on, on all these characterization methods, basically, there is a technical review, uh, which was published uh, in, in Nature Review Physics this year about quantum certification and benchmarking. And it basically is six pages long to cover as many of the overview, panoramic overview over the entire field. So, it, so it's a six pages really fast ride trying to, to really get the stretch of what could be meant with certifying quantum devices, starting like from full tomography and then going all the way to blind computation and also more cryptographically inspired methods. And it tries to just, I mean, give you an overview and capture it. So it's a nice, nice guidance. At the, the opposing end, we also like put a tutorial out um, together with Martin Klich, who's in Düsseldorf, uh, on the theory of quantum system certification, which is more like a like a deep dive into a couple of techniques like randomized benchmarking, direct fidelity estimation, um, other like direct fidelity certification methods, also cross entropy benchmarking. Um, so a couple of selected tools together with the mathematical framework in order to understand this. And the while like this nature review is just text. The other one is like theorems and proofs and also like introduce the mathematics you need. And then lastly, on the theory of randomized benchmarking, which also become a really broad field, we have just uh, this month put out uh, a huge manuscript trying to basically cover all randomized benchmarking methods which are out there and just pushing their guarantees to the state of the art of allowing for, for example, gate dependent noise and still getting recovery guarantee, uh, guarantees for the data model in the randomized benchmarking work. So this just as a, as a teaser, which I'll not talk about this. This talk will be about another problem, which is qu quantum state tomography. So in quantum state tomography, 
one wants to characterize the state preparation device typically. And the state preparation device can just spit out IID copies, or we assume it can spit out IID copies of a quantum state. Then this is fed into a measurement device, and then you may get out classical data, which is some vector, and the vector dimension of this data is m, which I will refer to uh, of and then you have to feed in this data into a classical computer and the classic computer spits out your state estimate. Okay, but in practice, it's good to model that the measurement device also depends on some calibration parameters. So you need to calibrate this, per, um, this measurement device. And now you have the following problem that basically your state estimate will depend on the calibration parameter. At the same time, in order to calibrate a measurement device, you need high accurate state preparation most of the time, at least uh, eventually at some point where you cannot like with building trust or cross references get further. But I mean, improving state preparation was the very first task we started out with. So this kind of closes a vicious cycle. So um, in order to get high, to improve state preparation, you need to high calibrated measurement devices, but the calibration also depends on how good you can actually control states. And the question we want to ask here is, can we somehow break this wishes cycle? And the idea would be to perform a blind tomography where you can infer a state estimate simultaneously without knowing the calibration parameters. And there's a slightly different formulation, which you can call self-calibrating tomography, which you can ask, can you simultaneously infer the state estimate and the, the calibration parameters. And this has been asked, these questions. For example, there, there's work on self-calibrating tomography more experimentally, where they just try to, to, to fit different models. There's different work on photonics. Um, there's work by Cyril Stark, which looks at, at correlation matrices. But so far, there are no really theoretical guarantees um, to, to see uh, and to investigate this. Um, and this is also like really the setting of, of state tomography as opposed, for example, to more like when you have gates and you can ask more, pro uh, you can just spend the probability distribution and your measurements with the gate you're asking itself, for example, gate set tomography or also spam robust uh, tomography, which works for processes differently. But this is really like still in the state picture. Um, sorry, Ingo, can I ask? So, yes, because I was like under the impression that gate set tomography, it's maybe inefficient, but in principle, so it's not proven that it converges, like under some. That's reason. completely correct. Not proven. Ah, I see. No, Actually, it's not proven. This is, this, it, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely not clear. And, and um, there's a, there's a comprehensive uh, perspective on this, which is in, in the end, what you're trying to do in gate set tomography is to, you try to complete a matrix product state from the entries. So you can see like the, the chain and then you just select, see a couple of entries of some, some tensor network basically, and then you want to complete the entire tensor network. And these are highly complicated problems. And yeah, we, we are working on this. So it's, it, but it's, it's, I mean, we have ideas to improve um, uh, algorithms and, 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 and get a better data processing, but so far we have not yet made any significant step in order to prove under which conditions this converges. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so plant tomography, calibration and um, uh, parameters and state should be inferred simultaneously. So the first thing you can do is in the end, I mean, this will be a linear inverse problem, so we can start counting parameters. If D is the Hilbert space dimension, then the number of independent measurements, if you don't assume that, that like, I mean, you can do the same measurement in different ways, differently influenced by the calibration parameters, are basically d squared. And the number of unknown parameters are also order of d squared for the state, but then there are n additional calibration parameters, which we want. So this is kind of daunting here. Um, so can I, uh, sorry, can I ask something? Uh, so yes. Here? So by it's terminology. What do you mean by independent measurement? So you like, cause in principle, like, I mean, so you, I guess you don't mean like the P of VM, but uh, like I how mean, many variables are needed? This is how, how many variables? Yeah. I mean, I, 
okay, I'll take here more like the historic perspective on computer sensing. So think, for example, on expectation values of observables, which you can see. Sure, sure. Because yeah. like just to, it's like you don't mean like actually like because in, in principle you can use for example a, a, like a single measurement to, to get all those. I mean uh, many queries to the same measurement to get information about the state, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Um so what we'll do in order to get around this is we'll use structure assumption. And um one really good assumption sorry to again be, yeah. sorry again I, uh, like in what sense you have like what gives you this number of unknown uh, it's just like, the parameter in arbitrary density matrix is something like d squared uh, so you know the, the, no the, this this squared i understand because mm -hmm. this is the dimension of like Hermitian okay. matrices roughly speaking yeah. like uh right uh, but then you have this uh unknown parameters, which is like where this number comes from, basically. Uh, this the unknown is... parameters, the unknown parameters are, I mean, I want to learn the state and I want to learn the calibration parameter. So it's D squared mm -hmm. and D, D, uh, an additional Right, ah, so you sort of assume that you basically query, you, you are getting like expectation values or maybe estimates for expectation values. And yes, then so some me measurement data, some classical measurement data out of this. And for example, I can measure like an yeah. orthogonal basis, which would give me then like D squared independent outputs. So a vector of D squared entries. And then I have the problem of inferring D squared plus N parameters. Fine, fine. Okay. But it's often a good assumption that the state is actually of low rank. Um, for example, experimentalists will may, maybe have pure, uh, near to pure states, or at least they will be, uh, it will be sufficient to, to return a, a pure state approximation to the state that's actually happening in order to get some information. Um, so this already reduces one of the Ds to basically two times Rd. So we are getting some headroom. We can even improve the headroom if we think of a, of a sparse calibration vector. So for example, you can think of, um, of a lot of different models with a lot of different parameters potentially explaining your, uh, the deviation of the measurement device, but in the end, only a couple of them are the actual explanation which will happen. So this having a sparse vector allows you to, to be a bit blind about how to model the measurement device, but in the end, if the crown truth is one of the models, you, you'll also get in, in, in a sparse regime. And this already like gives us R times D plus S log N basically uh, information which we need to, to infer. And then the last thing which uh, in assumption which I want to, to assume in order to get started and be able to formulate the quantum is that we actually have a linear calibration model. So think of this, that the device is already calibrated, there's a baseline calibration, and then there's a small deviation from this baseline calibration, and the linear expansion of this measurement model will actually work. So then basically the measurement device can just be modeled by a huge linear map, which acts on the, the outer product of the calibration vector and the row, because the, me uh, the measurement will also be linear in row. So uh, may I uh, ask something like, uh, so how, uh, how should I think about this calibration parameters? Because like I was thinking about them like something which uh, describes me a noise on the, this measurement. Uh, but now I'm not so sure about this. Like, could you no, it's, it's elaborate really a little bit? <laughs> it's, it's really systematic errors. And I, I mean, I can just give you one example, which ah, would okay. be the next sure. slide, right. which is if, if you think of, of state tomography with, from Pauli observables, which is like the, the standard uh, compressed sensing setting which people have looked at. So you have some, uh, you make statistical estimates of Pauli observables. This gives you some linear map, and then you can subsample, for example, for low rank states. Um, then in practice, in order to, you will be able to directly implement a basis measurement, but in order to, to measure a, a Z basis measurement, the computational basis, but in order to implement like an X or Y measurement, you will apply uh, single qubit gates in order to, to do this. And if now these single qubit gates all uh, are not 
highly calibrated, but for example, like slightly over rotate or come with, with some, some drift because they need some time in order to work and the qubit is just, just drifting in another uh, slightly higher frequencies, then um, you end up with basically a model where you say instead of measuring x, you basically get a linear uh, map, which some chances that you're a bit over rotated x to x, this is like the, the, the high, and then some smaller parameters x to y, where instead of measuring x, you also have a bit of y, z component. So your measurement is slightly in a different frame. And for example, like a sparsity assumption would mean that such a rotation only happens in this model in one plane, which is like the xy plane, which we know, but assuming we would not know which plane this is. So then you end up with basically a linear problem, which somehow looks like different measurement components acting on the row with different calibration parameters. So you can just cast it as something like this. So this is kind of like the, the model which we have. Uh, so do, do you assume here that the Z measurement is perfectly prepared then? Uh, like if you have only Z uh, or, or it's not necessary? Um, it's not necessary. You can also decorate this one. Mm -hmm. Sure, cool. I mean, this would be like the, the X, X that this also has a different. And in principle, I mean, this is just one example. And I mean, this is fairly theoretical still. Right. Um, but it, it's kind of inspired on what happens when you when you rotation and then you just expand it. In the end. Uh, can I have, uh, yeah. sorry, Ingo. Uh, like, I want to ask about the first equation there. So uh, it's, what like uh, state tomography via of low rank density matrix uh, in this uh, yeah in the compressed sensing like so so you 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 are, you are okay you didn't expect complex sensing but me uh, like under uh, what what should I say like it allows sometimes like to to get like if you have some assumption about I don't know like sparsity of rho maybe then you can get uh, like uh, you can often like suppress the, the the theoretical like you need in fact much less parameters and you can like with high yeah. probability su suppress the theoretical limit. So my question is like here you need expectation values of uh, of those observables, right? Yes. Uh, so my question is like, did people work on uh, like okay? But because in practice. Uh, you 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 have to run many experiments your, on your device, and you have like okay. So you have you have uh, the, the entire statistics. Yes. Yeah. The question is uh, like, uh, you know, because like in principle, like it might be possible that maybe like in ultimately what counts perhaps is like some combination of the number of measurement settings and the number of samples that you are. Yeah. Uh, getting like this, this is this is this is completely correct and I mean this is kind of like I mean because the compressed sensing literature don't does not have like the 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 randomness in the measurement itself so you you in the proof techniques which we'll also do you inject randomness in the measurement map setting so you have really like a linear inverse problem with a random measurement map and then you can show recovery guarantees and this is kind of like I mean what what David introduced he, uh, to to what compressed sensing state tomography um, and in the end, I mean, if you now look at the measurement settings in the center of observables, as you, you, you told it, then, I mean, you get the optimal number. But if you look at the sampling complexity, you are actually much, uh, you, you get a square root, uh, a square additional square. You're actually d squared r squared. So you're suboptimal. Um, and it, it took people, especially Richard Kung, who did his PhD, basically asking this question, what can you do if you have the click statistics of this? quite some time to find a much easier way in order to analyze these compressing type of things, namely just using one Bernstein concentration argument to see that you have a spectral norm estimator and then seeing that if you, you are low rank and you project to the positive cone, that your spectral norm estimator can just be transferred to a trace norm estimator mm -hmm. at the cost of only D times R um, additional factor. So nowadays you can just, I mean, with, with like this, these, um, um, yeah newer linear inversion post-projection analysis, you can, can get the, the optimal sampling complexity for a two-design POVM measurement. Uh, yeah. And you can also cool. show the, the sampling complexity at the lower bounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. This work was not out there when we started our this model. <laughs> um, okay. So 
we end up with a structured recovery problem. Oh, we, we don't hear you, Michal. So, sorry, Ingo, but Michal was saying okay. something about... Uh, I, I can't hear him, do you? No, I can also not hear No. Yeah. Oh, so uh, it's, maybe now. Now, oh, yes. yes. No, so like, I, I, I'm not like criticizing. I'm, it's more like I want to there and that's why I'm asking. Those yeah, no, 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 no. It, 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 it's a very fair question. And I mean, this is kind of, I mean, the work here again, focused like on, on reducing measurement settings. And it, it's really a question also um, on what type of, of um, machine you're running this. For example, for photonics people, reducing measurement settings is, is really important. If you don't have like integrated photonics, they are really reluctant to measure in another basis or like change the measurement settings. But they give you click statistics really easily. So, I mean, estimating an expectation value is not a thing. While if you have an iron trap quantum computer anyway, then like, I mean, they are loading the circuit and cooling the trap anyway every time. So for them always like doing a random new measurement setting in every shot mm -hmm. is, is, is a fair, fair point. So there, yeah. I mean, it depend, depends on the, the application, what you actually want to do. Um, okay, so now I've motivated like the, the problem. So we are interested in solving like a linear inverse problem. We are given a vector y, which comes out from a linear map, which acts on some signal, which is of the form xi o times rho. And this signal is now highly structured. There's the one thing, is it's actually the outer product of two uh, signals. The one signal is a sparse vector, and the other thing is a positive low rank uh, matrix, namely a low rank quantum state, which is trace normalized. So you can think of this as a sparse vector here, just the, the non vanishing entries are the black ones, all times some state, and then you, you can think of this as a huge vector of matrices, basically, and they are the same state, basically, in all the non vanishing entries, just rescaled by the calibration parameter. So it's just the trace, basically, which, which is the calibration parameter of these problems. And the plant tomography problem then ends up to given y and a reconstruct x under the assumption that x is actually in these structure set omega. Okay, this was the motivation of the plant tomography problem. Um, now, an outline for the rest of the talk. I'll we basically, I mean, I'll walk you through the results and how we actually uh, solve this after giving you a short introduction to compress sensing to also review these parts of things and, and then conclude with an outlook. So um, I think I wanted to say something else here. I actually wanted to more detailedly say that, I mean, our results are basically that we, we will relax the problem to a slightly simpler problem, the low rank demixing problem. Then we can propose an algorithm which is efficient to actually solve the problem. Then we can also equip this algorithm with theoretical guarantees and also test it in numerical simulations. Okay, starting with compress sensing. So what is compress sensing all about? Compress sensing is a mathematical framework to actually study these type of problems, namely linear inverse problems with structure. So a linear inverse problem, you can think of like a huge matrix and some vector and you're given some data. And now given A, uh, and this vector here is typically smaller than actually the signal. So the typical composition question is given Y and A, can we reconstruct X? And if M is smaller than N without any other structure assumption, the answer is simply no, we cannot invert this matrix. It's a, a small and fat matrix. But um, if we make other structure assumptions, for example, sparsity is the standard assumption in compressed sensing, um, then you can actually solve this problem. And then it becomes like recovering uh, a signal in a union of subspaces. But you can also make other structure assumptions, for example, structured sparsity assumption, instead of like just saying the vector has S non-vanishing entries, you can ask that the entries are in blocks and per block they're only S entries and then they're only a couple of vanishing blocks or you can have like some tree uh, model of this and all these things also appear in practice. And for example, this work also is inspired on uh, um, work which we have done on hierarchical sparsity, which was um, motivated from 5G mobile communication, so user detection in 5G networks. Um, you can also have low rank assumptions for matrices, the non commutative analog, or you can go to low tensor rank, which is, for example, this the thing which appears in the, the um, gate set tomography problem. And 
the crux somehow is with the problem is that what you want to do is you want to find the vector with the smallest support node that solves this linear equation. And in general, this is an NP-hard problem. So you cannot hope to actually have an efficient algorithm that solves this. But there exist efficient algorithms that rely, for example, on convex relaxation. For example, you can relax this, the support, which is also called the L0 norm, to an L1 norm, which is an actual convex norm. And then this is an efficient linear problem uh, program, which you can run on your computer. And then what people found in practice is that it's often solved actually the problem and compressing like the, the genesis of compressing was the insight, how to prove theoretical guarantees under which conditions um, this problem is actually solved. It's kind of like an average easy assumption that on like an ensemble of matrices, um, you can actually, the, the convex relaxation actually solves the original problem with high probability. Um, there are other algorithms, thresholding algorithms, which will feature in this talk, greedy algorithms. Um, so this is like the convex relaxation um, and also like more modern techniques like non-convex optimizations or manifolds. And we'll here see like thresholding algorithms combined with non-convex optimization. And these algorithms come with recovery guarantees. And to sum up, the compressing game is going to prove a recovery guarantee for a certain algorithm for a circle measurement ensemble and signal structure. And we'll play this type of game in this talk. Original examples, which we already had, is quantum state tomography. You can find the arbitrary pure state from Pauli measure expectation values of Pauli measurements via the nuclear norm minimization, which is kind of like the relaxation of the rank um, from M times d log d, so instead of d squared um, Pauli measurements. But you can also generalize this to gate tomography. This is a work which we done uh, two years ago. So the statement is you can find a unitary gate from a few average gate fidelities, namely uh, just d squared, which is the degree of a unitary gate, average gate fidelities with respect to random Clifford matrix, uh, via just a constrained least square fit. So this is interesting because these average gate fidelities can be achieved by randomized benchmarking experiments. So you can hope that you can get them spam robustly out of randomized benchmarking experiments, and then you can, can reconstruct an arbitrary unitary gate from them. Okay, so what is iteratively hard thresholding? This is the- uh, Sir, may I ask like about the previous slide? So are you talking about like finding uh, the unitary gate uh, in a sense that uh, you put something in a device and you want to check what is the closest unitary that fits the data. Uh, that's what it means, yes? Or th th this, is, this is one way to think of it. You can also okay. think, mm -hmm. okay, you, you have some device and you, you can perform like a gate set and then you want to know like the uh, unitary calibration error which happens or you interleave the unitary with gates, say Clifford gates, which you know that, that you have fairly good control and then you can learn the interleave gates uh, in, a, in a rank warm approximation. Yeah, but I think what is important, I, I guess the origin of Philip's question was that uh, you look at this unitary, you don't have the assumption that whatever you have there is a unitary, but you see it like uh, in the space of channels, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. it's like, because otherwise you don't have formally the, the speed up, right? Uh, uh, right, because like... Yeah, I mean, they, they are, they are, okay. There are two things you you can show. I mean, you assume that it's a unitary gate which is happening, and then you can can show a guarantee which you can then prove is stable under like weaken this assumption. So, if if the gate which is happening is like highly mixed, then like I mean, the the higher rank, the higher cross rank operators just mess up your guarantee, and you you will not see like the the dominant component. But if there is some gap, so some dominant rank one uh, gate happening, and then some some correction, then it remains stable. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, like a robustness of the guarantee. Okay, so it hopefully had thresholding. So another way to formulate the compressing problem is just to say, I want to fit in the square norm. So fitting the data in the square norm, and I want to minimize the fitting error subject to actually my constraint. And um, the simplest algorithm which people can do is something which one would nowadays call projective gradient, but it's in composition literature called iteratively hard thresholding, which is just you perform a gradient step and then you just project onto your structure. Then you perform a gradient step, project on structure, you iterate until you converge. 
And this works for compress sensing problem because most pro uh, projectors which uh, you encounter in compress sensing are actually easy projectors. For example, the original compress sensing problem was MP hard, but the following problem is pretty easy. If you just want to project onto sparse um, uh, signals, so if there's no A here, which was formerly, but you leave the A as just the identity, then finding this S sparse approximation to a vector is pretty easy. You just select the largest, uh, the largest entry in absolute value and set the other one to zero. The same also holds if you want um, the rank R PSD projection. So you want to project onto like a positive semi-definite rank R matrix. You do the same thing, just the same operator just on the spectrum and you also throw away the negative entries if necessary. So these are easy projections. So, okay, we had such a compressing problem in the very beginning, but like this highly structured set of some auto product of a vector and things. So can we actually calculate the projection which would give it, put us into business? And the first result which we prove is basically that there exists no polynomial time algorithm that it calculates. So this is also calculating the projection. It's also an NP hard instance. And the proof basically can show that, like, I mean, you can reduce the sparse PCA problem to K click and you can then embed um, this problem into the sparse PCA problem. So, like, already the outer product of two sparse vectors is already uh, pro problematic. And this is kind of like a non commutative analog of this now having a low rank matrix. So we face a problem that we cannot actually calculate this projection. But there's a slightly simpler problem which we can actually tackle, which is the, the problem of sparse demixing. So if instead we assume that in, instead of having an outer product, we just allow the different matrices in the different blocks of our matrix here, to be also different matrices. So we just introduce this index i, and then we don't enforce that these matrices are all the same, but we let them, them differently. This gives us what we call the sparse demix, and now we have the sparse sum of, of matrices, of different matrices. And we can look at the sparse demixing problem um, and ask the same structured recovery problem. And since our original Applying tomography data set, like the outer products, is, is a subset of this. If we can solve the sparse demixing problem, then obviously we can also solve the plant tomography problem, but we introduce more decrease of freedom. And the sparse demixing problem actually could convince exactly this, this hardness result. And you can, can use a technique, which I refer to as hierarchical thresholding, in order to calculate the projection. So projecting on these type of thickness is pretty easy. You just project every block onto the low rank matrix and then you just select the largest blocks afterwards. So you have like a step-by-step -step hierarchical approach to actually calculate this projection. And this is what we call the sparse demixing algorithm. It's basically the iteratively hard threshold algorithm that uses the projector onto like the sparse demixing structure. So our algorithm performs the gradient step um, and then basically projects onto these uh, outer sums, the sparse sums of low rank matrices. And then we also do a couple of, of, of more fancy geometrical tricks. So we do like a tangent space projection on the low rank manifold of, of the state of the manifold of low rank states. So you can project to the tangent space first in order to get better step estimates and stuff. So you can combine this with geometrical techniques to do these type of optimization so, in order to get faster but convergence. In the end, do you, do you get like some convergence guarantees or you, you get a uh, efficient Yes, so, what, so now we have an algorithm, so now we can, can look what the analytical results we can prove about this. And the standard technique to prove these type of convergence guarantees or recovery guarantees in compress sensing is to look at the so-called restricted isometry properties. So if you can show um, that the matrix basically restricted on your, to your signal cl uh, class acts approximately as an isometry so that it does not distort your norm too much, and there's a constant delta, then um, you can, can often prove recovery guarantees for these type of algorithms. And this is basically what we can prove. Prove if, this, if your measurement matrix A has like this omega delta, so for this signal class restricted asymmetry property with some restricted asymmetry property constant smaller than one third, then the SDT algorithm converts to the correct solution of the sparse demixing problem. So this algorithm comes with a full fledged recovery guarantees in terms of a rip. Now the question of course is, okay, what type of, of um, matrices A 
have this restricted isometry property. And these restricted isometry property has the problem um, that you can only typically make random, like randomized arguments in order to show if efficiency of them. For a fixed matrix, you cannot show like to have an optimal restricted isometry property. Um, so the simplest isometry you can look of is if you say that the entire matrix just consists of blocks of random Hermitian operators then uh, drawn from the uh, ground uniform, uh, unitary ensemble, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, sorry. Um, and I'll just skip the, the details and just give you the summary. So basically you can show that, that if you draw this thing Hermitian Gaussian, then um, you get for this, this type of matrix a uh, restricted isometry property. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Go, go, uh, can I, I need to stop you for a bit? So, yeah. like, uh, I understand that for specific H, it's difficult to to have this uh, partial isometry property, uh, and then for some uh, random constructions, it's possible. But then, uh, can you just go a bit slower with parameters? Like, uh, yeah, because I like. Can you just recap what like B was the dimension R was yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll know exactly do this. So, um, so when we come now back nice. to, <laughs> to, to our decrease of, of, of freedom. So we, we look at like, like vectors which consist entry wise of matrices. So in the end, I mean, if we have Hilbert space dimension D, so we can think of this as, as made as N D times D matrices. So the entire parameter count without any structure is basically n plus d squared. So now the blind tomography problem we already counted, this is something like d times r if we make a low rank assumption, every matrix is d times r, and then we have an s sparse vector, which basically is s times log n because we need like log n bits in order to encode the support because the support is still random. So let s log n plus d r would be like the optimal count. And now if you count the parameters of the sparse demixing problem, you end up introducing an, an additional S, so the sparsity because you, you make the, the blocks independent again. So you have S D times R matrices. And what we can find is that for like this uh, really nice Gaussian ensemble, that then really the number of measurements which you need or measurement settings which you need is S log N plus D R S. So we really get like the optimal count for the sparse demixing problem, which is not like, I mean, the most we could hope for because we relax the problem to another problem. So we are not at the blind tomography problem. But at the same time, I mean, you only have like the log n scaling. So if you're really like in the, in the setting where like your calibration parameter are sparse, then this might not be a price too high to pay if you make the, this structure assumption. So I think I, oh yeah, I could have changed this also with the pictures. Um, yeah, so we can show that you get a recovery guarantee for the algorithm and you can also like, I mean, under impractical, but like say, I mean, this is like a model where the measurement and the calibration are as unstructured as possible and as uncorrelated as possible, we can show that you get away with optimal number of measurement setting um, for the sparse demixing problem. So the, the price you actually have to pay is like this additional S in the scaling, which might not be too bad. Um, Okay, then you could also make another heuristic ap approach to the algorithm, which is just you can solve it with an alternately square algorithm. So if you if you have something like depending on two signals, you can also just say I fix the one signal, I optimize the one thing, the one hand, so I optimize over the xi, then I fix the whole the xi, I optimize over the row, and then I just alternate. And I can still assume all the structure, so I make this cut here explicit, but I also can assume the sparsity structure and I can assume the lowering structure and we can basically just use the algorithm as before, just restrict it to the, the, the trivial class. This is the alternating the square algorithm, which is a much more, but much faster way to actually solve this, the, the problem. But then we are not in compressing land anymore and it's hard to actually prove recovery guarantees. But there's, this is kind of like heuristic algorithm, which can deal with the same problem. Why am I telling this? Because we also do, did a lot of numerics and we did numerics with the uh, um, with the demixing algorithm, but we also did numerics with the ALS algorithm. So this is if you say your measurement is random subsample poly measurements and also your calibration blocks. So whatever mix is also just random poly measurements. 
Um, then this plot basically shows you against the number of measurement, the state reconstruction error. So there is some level of the calibration coefficients, which is like 10 to the minus one. This is like the size where the calibration coefficients are randomly drawn um, around. So this means that in the, the standard tomography, lowering tomography algorithm cannot basically go much below this baseline because at that point, just the correction coming from the, the unknown calibration could, um, yeah, limits the precision. But the um, demixing algorithm can basically go here. Is the, this is the median which is plotted, go basically much lower to 10 to the minus four, which is the then only bounded by statistical noise. So this illustrate that you, I mean, if you have calibration parameters, which we set up in the data here in on, on numerical simulation, that you can actually beat standard tomography by just adjusting for this. And uh, sorry, I just question because like things are go moving fast. So the error, how do you measure the error? Is it like in the Frobenius norm or the... Uh, this is the trace norm error, trace I norm. Okay. hope. Yes, this is uh, trace norm. Okay, and I uh, so uh, this is taken like for uh, from how many samples? Because I understand that simulations were to like uh, uh, really sample those measurements, right? Yeah. Um, I don't have the number written here. So this is typically sure. Um, so I mean, we just mm -hmm. I mean we just calculate the expectation value and then we just simulate the shot noise on it. Um, Ah, okay. So, the, <laughs> I mean, nice. just to, to, to speed up. So mm -hmm. we just sample them from a from a binomial distribution around the uh, around the, the mean. Yes. But I mean, you can can basically see that uh, think that like I mean the the sample complexity will be something like ten to the four or something like this, or ten to the three, whatever you need in order to get ten the this cutoff to ten to the minus four. Most probably, since this is epsilon squared, it might be that we have like something like ten to the seven or ten to the eight number of samples in order to get like the thing. So if the statistical noise just, I mean, moves up like the, your, your limitation here, you also like, I mean, don't have that much of advantage. And it's for three qubits, uh, right? Uh, it's for D equal to eight, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this is. But so, uh, but, uh, okay. But I, as far as I remember you, what you need to estimate here is the, expected value of the like local Hamiltonian, right? Or or not? Ah, no, okay, sorry, uh, my bad. No, it's, it's it like, was it's like it's a like, generic poly it's string. A, it's a poly string, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, yeah. Thank, uh, thanks, exactly. right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then I presented you like a more realistic setting where I talked about over rotations and under rotations in the very beginning. So there were like, when, when you have to implement your, your Z basis measurement and then they, they are over rotated. Um, and what we found that this, I mean, we know that if we have enough random and the, the calibration measurement setting is unstructured enough, then we actually have an analytical guarantee. But in practice, like the calibration model will be not like this, it will be somehow correlated. And what we found, uh, what was a bit disappointed is that the SDT algorithm does not uh, is not able to tackle the, the realistic setting, which I, I teased in the very beginning. So there we had to resort to our constrained ALS implementation of this. And there we got, got really nice results. So also like for these over rotation, under rotation settings where you actually recover the over rotation, under rotation, the alternatingly square algorithm um, with the structure assumption is able to basically at not that many measurement settings for this is, uh, yeah, this is four qubits now. Um, actually uh, reconstruct the, the calibration parameters of this model and then, then also uh, be able to... Sorry, can you just uh, uh, re recall those over-rotated, under-rotated yes, Saudi measurements? So, sorry, I, I don't remember what they were really. Yeah, no problem. Let me go to the slide. I thought about having the slide again once before I do this. This would be so. Th the idea was you, you subsample some poly matrices, yeah, which is the actual experiment which you want to do, and then you estimate every poly expectation values of some poly string um, with some precision. But then you say in order to implement actually Z uh, in X and Y measurement, you come with additional constraints, which ends up in basically giving you different parameters. 
uh, in this thing. So every, if I have, for example, the Pauli string, I want to measure the Pauli string X, Y, Z, then the actual is, then I also get, get one correction block where the X is replaced to a Y, decorated with some parameter C, X, Y, and one where the, the X is, uh, is uh, the Y is replaced by Z with the, the coefficients in front of this. And then I just mm -hmm. keep the linear terms of exchanging all possibilities. So you can just sort of think of it as like some random Pauli, uh, Pauli random Clifford errors or something like that, right? You can like view. Uh, it's, an, it's an arbitrary rotation. It's not really a Clifford error. Because I mean, what, what I mean, happens it, when it you rotate a up. bit? But this this xi is it like uh, this xi is like those xi are arbitrary, let's say. Yes, exactly. They they I are see. some I small see. small angles. Yeah, and I the xi is see. actually what you want. It's kind of like on every qubit you have like the same type of over rotation in your Hadamard gate. Let's say you you do like a different angle in x, then this is actually then something no, like two, so two like sides. Basically, you can just model it by random rotations applied, let's say, on a on every qubit individually yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for these type of things, we are actually able to with fairly with a fairly reasonable amount of measurement settings to to get the the um, the parameters. And again, I mean, beat the unfair comparison against standard tomography that just does not try to to actually um, estimate the parameter in the first place. Okay. So let me sum up. Um, we started with the facing this vicious cycle of, of having a cal to calibrate a measurement device to do state tomography. And we asked the question, can we simultaneously infer rho and xi? And the, the first things we have an analytical answer to this, yes, not with an optimal complexity, but we have a recovery guarantee with a slightly suboptimal complexity. Um, and we do about this by exploiting structure, the low rank and the sparsity structure to get in, into a regime which is actually interesting uh, and, and get enough headroom in the number of degree of freedom to, to invert the map in the first place. Then we relax the, pro uh, relax the problem to efficient projection. We use geometrically enhanced iteratively hard threshold algorithm to do this, so some sending type algorithm. We can prove a rip-based recovery guarantee, which basically it's the assumption that your measurement is not structured enough or the, the calibration measurement model is not uh, uh, very structured, then with high probability, we have a recovery guarantee. Um, and this paradigm of using the structure in order to do blind tomography also um, solved in this semi-realistic model of uh, trying to, to recover uh, rotational angles with the, the heuristic algorithm. Okay, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Inga, for a very nice talk. Right. Thanks. Uh, right. We have time for questions, comments. Uh, I did ask many of them, so please, please, guys. Yeah. So, small question. Maybe I missed this. So, uh, a few slides ago, when uh, you had to use heuristic algorithm. Yes. So, sorry, yeah. what was the bottleneck to, to not use the, the thing with the, the, the iterative one with the recurrent? Yeah. So the, the, this is kind of like the, the setting which I present in the beginning where you really have like this rotate, rotation. So there's like a deterministic way to produce from like the uh, random set of, of poly words, which is like your target measurement, which you want to perform to produce like the calibrated corrections to this, which can, can kind of mix in with lower parameters. So there's a deterministic way. Um, mm -hmm. And thereby they are also kind of correlated and structured. And especially a lot of these, these lines which come out are actually zero. So a lot of like, I mean, um, corrections do not feature in this thing because if, if like a measurement line does not have an X string, then I mean, there's no contribution of that line into the XY. And we, we just <laughs> numerically find, I mean, I think it's kind of hopeless to, to prove um, any and like reasonable recovery guarantee, but at least right. numerically we, we find that unless you go to ridiculously high system dimension where then we, we run into the problem that we still have to recover D time D matrices and blocks of them, that, that it just does not recover it. We, yeah, 
it gets a long way. So for example, you can discriminate between different calibration blocks with the algorithm, or you can, can find like one calibration correction if the target measurement is not there, but like the, the entire thing just didn't, didn't recover. Uh -huh. Thanks. Okay, I have one more. Um, so, like, is there a hope, you know, to, let's say, get some analytical results for the models that are, let's say, less abstract? I don't know how to phrase it. Like, you, you can assume that, for example, your errors, they're of really sort of like particular types because of, uh, well, like your measurement errors, like because of like physics or because how people like have experience with those, uh, like with those systems, right? So, and then uh, kind of have analogous like guarantees, like you really like cut the space of your parameters, like where you can have errors, but. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, 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 okay, let me see whether I understand the question correct, but. The, the, the method in the beginning, I mean, starts from having some model of the arrows. You know? So, I mean, basically you have like how, the, the, how the, the measurement map acts on the different plots is kind of in the model so that you only end up with like some linear calibration parameters. You know? So the, the, this is why I call it semi-device dependent. It's not, it's not like trying to, to do full tomography of the measurement, but we are really in the corner where we say, okay, we started from wanting every information we can have about the state. We only make one assumption, namely the low rankness of the state. But then we still start with a fairly good understanding of how our calibration model works. Yeah. So therefore, like the, the method intrinsically needs some description and then like a couple of parameters to, to, to found this. Um, and then we, we looked at two models. The one is like completely unstructured to think of like the corrections are just randomly drawn and then everything in theory looks okay. But I mean, this is this is unrealistic in any applications. I mean, why, why should I try to model with like some randomly drawn corrections by my calibration? Um, so- Wait, I'm, I'm confused. What do you mean by randomly drawn? Corrections. Like I mean, we gen just generate the data with where like the corrections, like the 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 linear maps which are associated to a parameter are just randomly drawn. The, every line so, is just. So just why do you call it corrections? <laughs> uh, Be, okay, because no, okay. I just uh, I, I don't criticize. I just want. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no. I, I I call it correction because typically, I mean, the the idea is like one of the one of these linear maps is the target measurement which you wanted to do in the beginning. And then instead you do some linear sum of different maps. And th this is I, what I call correction. So for example, like in this, in this over rotating model, you have like one target block and then you had like additional corrections, which typically will come um, with smaller calibration parameters compared to the, to the dominant error. But you so, would... so the corrections mean like uh, the additional terms uh, with respect yes, exactly. to the one you would like to have. Okay, exactly. in yeah. this sense. Because so I think we were thinking with Michal uh, immediately about the like correcting the noise. At least I thought. No, no, no. I didn't. I was think thinking about correcting. This. I simply... yeah. sure. So, so cool. I mean, how how I think about like this linear model is always that that you have some some linear combination of these AI measurements and CIs, and typically, I mean, one will be the 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 target measurement. One of them will be the thing which you actually wanted to do. So this will come with a large coefficient, and then there will be small coefficients which come from um yeah so uh maybe about this so the uh uh like because you assume uh so is this like uh you assume that the uh, let's say for example high x arrow x is the uh, is higher than than yes, the other exactly. guys yes w which would be the case if, if like okay. the angle which comes from the harder mark uh, which you decorate the Hadamard by an additional rotation around the, the z-axis, then you end up. With yes, that. sure, sure. But then when you take a tensor product, then like everything becomes small, right? Uh, or, yeah, or I mean, in, in linear order, in linear this. order, I mean, you basically end up with the, with mm -hmm. the entire expansion of this. 
So you, you end up with, with like, okay. with like the, the nothing corrected, the rotation in every, every Q, uh, only one rotation. Yeah. Then the contributions of like two rotations simultaneously and so on. And you just throw away the, the higher order. So in principle, I mean, if you start with an exponential and then you expand the entire sum, you would end up with like entire polynomials in the Xs. And then you, I just say, okay, this motivates an approximation to linear order. Mm -hmm. So okay. in linear order, it's, it's only like the dominant contribution when one qubit was rotated. And this yeah, was yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I also, I mean, I, I, I talked to Norbert Linke at some point about, about this. I mean, this is, this, basically also origins from the discussion with them with him so i have some hope in order to to get data and and be able to get something out with this type of thinking but i am also aware that i mean this is like a fairly theoretical model of what is happening i mean it's more like okay i wanted to have a linear map in the first place and a linear reconstruction problem mm -hmm. well i i guess uh, that Typical, I mean, uh, you can always recast your parameters to be maybe formally linear, right? Like the way I understand that. Yes. Right? Because yeah. you say, okay, like you, you have with some probability or whatever, like something that you actually wanted to implement, and then you have some junk that you model in some way, right? And then like this junk is uh, like, I mean, you, you just have linear parameters, so it's not so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So I mean, I, yeah. I, I have the same feeling about this. <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you you could you most probably in many situations you can get away with this type of model. Right. So, uh, so do you guys plan to track it on uh, in experiments? <laughs> that... I've I've talked to him years ago about mm -hmm. this, and this is kind of like w <laughs> when I I looked like at, at some some applications. So um yeah. So so he was interested in, in, in sending data about this, but I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not actively collaborating with him on any experiment. Right. You know, these days you can maybe use your Twitch money <laughs> and uh, buy purchase access via cloud to like, uh, you know, to Amazon or something or to, and then just uh, play with it. I'm just laughing. You know, I mean, I, 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 right? I, I, like, but with like six, uh, six qubits in this uh, house. Yeah. Hannibal something like that. Sure. No, I, 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 yeah, I, I'm, yes. I think it's, it's a good topic for a bachelor or master's thesis to just <laughs> see whether this exactly. works out. Yes. Uh, sure, sure. All right. Any more questions to, to Ingo? Last chance, guys. Um, um, um. So, uh, have you, do you have man, maybe some prospects on the, like, this type of, uh, scheme, but when you don't actually have possibility to really estimate those expectation values reliably, like you know, some few measure, a few shots scenarios, which this is also like practically, practically quite relevant, right? Um, especially if this Pauli string is long, that because then like the sampling complexity is is uh, daunting. What, Michal? Yeah. I, you are. I mean, uh, like you, like mm -hmm. if you have just a few measurements, and it's not yes. daunting, like to estimate those. Well, yeah. So I meant that's the motivation. That because if the measurement complexity does not scale with the with the, the length of the string, it's just the problem that I mean, if your state you want to recover becomes large, then already like r times d many of these words will be will be daunting. But I mean, for everyone, you will just just invest one over epsilon squared shots. Okay, right. Um, yeah, this is, um, it, it, it's a good question. And I think, I mean, it, it's worth modeling it like this and then, then more look at, at, into the, the modern, more projection framework which Richard develops. For example, I think it should be possible if you additionally, for example, assume that the, the calibration parameters are positive then you end up in like a nice cone, basically, like it's, it's like a blockwise cone. So the, the signal structure still has, has quite some structure. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that for this, you can actually prove something about the projection and also like how, how norms will translate it by the projection. So there's definitely a way in order to, to get more like these, these methods. And then 
Um, also like just translate this to what Richard did, did afterwards, namely the shadow estimation, so that you're not interested in the entire state estimate, but only a yeah. couple of linear function on this from the same linear inversion estimator. So yeah, I I'm, I'm think it's, I mean, what is the, the takeaway message from here that you can like think of this as like this structured long signal, which just comes with more, more structure than beforehand, and then try to to do the same analysis in these type of things with, with the typical technology, which Richard is also using, um, I think it is a valuable way forward to say that you can infer calibration parameters and 24 fidelities with certain states in some efficient scaling. Nice. Uh, right, right. Uh, okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank Ingo uh, again for, for his time, for joining us today. Uh, I learned a lot uh, personally. Yes, uh, thank you all and like see you all next week. Thanks. Yeah, thanks thank a you. lot for having me. Thank you, Ingo. Yes. Thank you.